we have the unique privilege of spending this whole Lord's Day, our sermon this morning and tonight, on the theme. I can't think of a better way to launch the year, to frame where we're going with our small groups, and so much more. The most foundational habits that define the Christian, that define the church, all revolve around the one word, starts with a W, ends with a P, the study of worship. My title this morning is Seeking Worshippers. And we'll look at a number of texts, but you can go and turn to our main text, which we'll come to later, John 4, verses 20 through 24. John 4, verses 20 through 24, and we'll especially look at verses 23 and 24 in John 4. It is the most definitive biblical statement on true worship, unparalleled anywhere in Scripture, foundational to all that we say and do as worshipers of our Lord. Before, Lord willing, we next Sunday resume our expository verse-by-verse journey through Matthew's gospel. We want to focus on this theme. It's something that our elders have tasked me a while back to also spell out our Antioch's uh, philosophy of music and worship as a kind of next position paper as we've done on a number of issues as a church and much of this has been caught more than taught but in a day of great confusion we want to spell out exactly what happens especially in corporate worship and we'll look at a little more of this tonight. What should we expect? What, what, what happens when we worship? I like the way Aniel, Scott Aniel put it last year. At the end of the worship service, Christian my brother, my sister in Christ, church family, let me ask you, how do you know you've worshipped? I'm aiming for about, you know, 45-ish, 50-ish minutes from now as you greet and however long you enjoy fellowship, as you get in the car and you drive home, prove to me you worshipped. We live in a day and age that is deeply confused and uh, uh, poorly taught and profoundly has misunderstood how to identify and verify that you've actually worshipped. And what we should expect goes on when we worship. You and I know that typical visitors, wonderful to have newcomers looking for perhaps a stronger, a healthier, a better church for them spiritually. The top criteria often long before they analyze the church's doctrine or leadership or preaching. Far more important to visitors than the parking and the creche and uh, lots of other programs. They'll, They'll be very tolerant and forgiving of those things. Often the one thing they're sincerely asking is, did I enjoy the worship experience? But usually that means, did the so called Protestant sacrament of praise and worship, in other words, 20 minutes of music, song, and band performance deliver the buzz that I was expecting? Did the modern priest and mediator, the so-called worship leader and his team, create for me enough of a visceral, tangible, physical, emotional experience so that I'll come back next week? Did I get my worship fix? Drug, high, for the week. Never has it been more important, beloved, for us to recover a sound biblical definition of true worship in the face of so many forms of false or insufficiently biblical worship. We're going to look this morning and fly through nine questions about true worship. Nine questions about true worship. Some more by way of uh, introduction and also The first, really, five or six questions are more whole Bible, zooming out, wide-angle lens, topically, doctrinally, theologically, some questions about true worship. And then in the final three questions, seven, eight, and nine, we'll zoom back into this text here in John 4, and especially verses 23 and 24. First question. Why did God create this whole world in the first place? We start this way in our children's catechisms, do we not? Why did God make all things? Answer? How about this is as briefly as I can put it and as plainly as we find it often in the Bible. Romans eleven thirty six: From him, through him, and to him are? Anything left out? Couldn't be more comprehensive. All things are from the Lord, through 
the Lord and to the Lord. To him be glory forever. Colossians 1, 16, even more succinctly. All things created through Christ and for Christ. God made everything for worship. Number two, we're flying, aren't we? Why did God make the world? Number two, why did God make you? I can't think of a better question for launching a new year. Why did God make you? Genesis 1, day 6, verse 26. Unlike all the other animals, as the crown of his creation, in his image and likeness, to know and glorify him. What makes mankind unique, distinct from all the other creatures? It's this ability to worship, a desire for worship. Nothing higher, nothing nobler, nothing more uniquely human than this activity of worship. Westminster Confession, our Puritan forefathers nearly 400 years ago, the opening question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, let's say it together. The chief end of man, the whole purpose, the main business, the reason we exist, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Another theologian states, Christian worship is the most momentous, most urgent, most glorious action that can take place in human life. Number three, we've seen why God made the world, why God made you. Number three, what's wrong with worship? Why has it so often been soured and distorted and misdirected and perverted? What's happened to our worship? What's wrong with it? For this question, I want to call on one of the most insightful Christian voices in the 20th century, A.W. Tozer. A book on worship. Tozer writes, Man was made to worship God. God gave to man a harp. He gets this image from Scripture, right? God gave to man, picture it, a harp. And he said to man, here, above all the creatures I've made and created, I've given you the largest harp. Tozer says, the Lord tells man, I've put more strings on your instrument. I've given you a wider range than I've given to any other creature. You can worship me in a manner no other creature can. And yet when man sinned, he took that instrument, that harp, and he threw it down in the mud. We can talk about all the social ills and all your own concerns and all that troubles and ails us and our world. It all goes back to the harp in the mud, doesn't it? And a disordered worship. Tozer says, and there the harp has lain for centuries, rusted, broken, unstrung. And instead of playing a harp like the angels and seeking to worship God, man in all of his activities is ego-centered, self-worshipping, turned inward. Man sulks and swears and laughs and sings, but it's all without joy and without worship. And then Tozer concludes by showing it's not just a problem in the world, but also in worldly churches too often. He says, worship is, and this is the title of his book, the missing jewel in Christianity today. We're organized, he says. We work. We have our agendas. We have almost everything. But there's one thing churches, even good gospel churches, seem to have lacked and lost. It's the ability to worship. We're not cultivating the art of worship. It's the one shining gem lost to the modern church. And I believe we ought to search for it until we find it. If you agree with Tozer, we're better to recover this precious gem of worship than in the teaching of Jesus. We come here in John 4 to the classic biblical statement of what true worship is about. And before we read it, I want to point out to you from verse 20 through 24, maybe you want to underline it right now, you're going to find the English word worship in, in noun or verb forms ten times. And they're all from the same Greek word, proskuneo, compound word. Pros is to or towards, kuneo is to kneel or bow, to kneel towards, to bow down towards, to kiss and prostrate yourself, to worship. Ten times in five verses. Remember, this is the Samaritan woman. This is Jacob's well. This is a hot afternoon with the most unlikely person in the most unlikely of places with the Samaritan half-breed, half-Jew, outsider, defiled female, and a man approaches her, and she thinks she needs physical water, and he offers her everlasting satisfaction, spiritual living water, 
And then we pick up the narrative in verse 15. Let's stand and read our text today in honor of God's word. Please rise if you can. Listen as I read, picking up from John 4, verse 15. The woman says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He says to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, You have correctly said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman says to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Dear Lord, please teach us. If there's anything in life in this coming year, in our heart of hearts, and as a church that we want to get right and to be most reformed and biblical and mature and maturing in, it is our worship. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. We know the devil's favorite thing to corrupt and confuse is our worship. Teach us, Lord. Turn even here today some adulterer into an adorer of you. Rescue idolaters like this woman at the well and turn them into true worshipers by your gospel's mighty saving power. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. We have looked at the first three questions, why did God make the world? Why did God make you? What's wrong with worship? I want to briefly ask a fourth question. Is there anyone who doesn't worship? Is, is it a question of uh, uh, if you are worshiping or is it only a question of who or what you are worshiping? And on a little bit of a lighter but still a very sad note, let me illustrate with Mrs. Mario Rubio. An American woman in 1977 in the state of New Mexico who claimed to have a worship encounter while cooking in her kitchen. I know some of you ladies really enjoy cooking, but I wonder if you've ever taken it to this level. I hope not. As she was frying her flour tortillas, or as South Africans like to say, tortillas, she noticed that the marking on one of her tortillas resembled the face of Jesus. She showed it to her husband and her neighbors, and all agreed that this must be the Savior's face etched on that tortilla. She went to her priest. She asked him to bless her tortilla. This was a first for him, but he was a man after all and enjoyed good food. <laughs> so he agreed to do it. Mrs. Rubio then took the tortilla. She put it in a glass case with piles of cotton to make it look like Jesus was floating on the clouds. She built a special altar to it. She opened a little shrine for visitors. Within one month, more than 8,000 people came to this shrine to worship Jesus. I regret to inform you, I know you'll be very grieved to know that some 30 years later, in 2005, Mrs. Rubio's granddaughter took the tortilla to school for show and tell, and she accidentally dropped it, and the shrine has now been closed for business. Aren't you glad we aren't idolaters? It's only those other people long ago and far away and weird Americans. It illustrates a universal truth, doesn't it? People are worship. To worshipers, to be human is to worship. We are perpetual, incessant, incurable worshipers. Everyone attends worship services. It may not be at a tortilla shrine. It may not be in a church. There's countless other so-called sanctuaries uh, which, where people worship and adore their gods. It can be at work, at school, right? At play, at home, in a pub, a stadium, 
a party, a bedroom, over some drink or food or drug in front of a TV or a PC or a phone or a tablet, right? doesn't matter where you are. You are always worshiping someone or something. It isn't if. It's just where and who or what you worship. Romans 1 couldn't be clearer. Either we are honoring God and giving him thanks or we are exchanging his glory for created things that we worship. And here in John 4, Jesus meets this woman at the well. What is she worshiping? It's clear. Men, male intimacy, companionship, sexual fulfillment. We learn there in verse 18, she's on her sixth so-called husband. And she's still not satisfied. She's still thirsty and unquenched, perhaps like one of you or many of you here this morning. None of the stale waters of this world can satisfy. All the idols are, as the Bible says, but broken cisterns that frustrate and disappoint and they leave you empty, broken, bent and twisted, bitter and miserable in the end. Just like this woman. Until you come to the living waters, until you find the Son of God, until you meet the risen Christ who can promise that you will never thirst again and who alone can satisfy you. There is no one who doesn't worship. Question five. What is the definition of worship? We've already talked about the Greek word here ten times in five verses. Proskuneo, to prostrate, to kneel, to bow. The, the whole Bible is a call to worship, the entire message of Scripture. But the English word is interesting, isn't it? If you know royal... Uh, history, and you have followed the royal family, and you know how at least they used to especially address the king or queen and his majesty and her majesty. One of the English words they would use was his worthship, her worthship, which is what evolved into our English word worship. It's declaring the worth, the value, the dignity, the weighty gravity and majesty and honor and glory of another, their worth-ship. Now listen to some of the scriptural calls to worship that are surely a backdrop to what our Lord is teaching us and this woman here in John 4. Psalm 97, let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Psalm 95, come let us. Worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God and we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Psalm 99, exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. Holy is He. Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. William Temple gives what I think is one of the greatest definitions ever of worship. Listen closely. We'll circulate this this week perhaps in the newsletter or elsewhere. Temple writes, To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. That is a Bible-saturated definition of worship. We've seen why did God make the world? Why did God make you? What's wrong with worship? Anyone that doesn't worship, what's the definition of worship? Number six, how is the Bible one grand story of worship? Or if you'd like, what is the worship story of Scripture? And for this morning, I have a remarkably brief, an exceptionally succinct answer for you. And I know you're going to really appreciate this, even though tongue-in-cheek. The Worship story of Scripture will be tonight's sermon as an introduction because it'll be too rushed this morning. And so we'll see you tonight. <laughs> That's where you'll get the answer to number six. Stay tuned. See you in a few hours. Number seven. <laughs> as we will look at tonight, the Old Testament, Old Covenant journey and unfolding story of worship through the law and the prophets and the writings and as we'll 
also look at Psalm 15 tonight, we then ask number seven, how does the coming of Christ change worship? How does the coming of Christ change worship? In the advent of our Lord, as we've just celebrated last month, there is a massive, monumental, epic, and massive shift in worship. The coming of Christ marks the end of the role of the temple in the life of a true worshiper. If you've seen so often in the news daily now, all eyes on the Temple Mount, the uh, Muslim Dome of the Rock. If you saw a few days ago the Jewish people and various rabbis and different sects of Judaism had an unusual unified gathering for obvious, well, what should be obvious reasons, weeping, pleading with God for the 130 plus hostages and gathering at the Wailing Wall. And, And we look at that place for worship and in many ways indeed to understand where all of history is going. And we've talked about that here often and from this pulpit. Even as the text says here, salvation is from the Jews. And that's why last October we did a two-part message on the evils of anti-Semitism. But Jesus is causing a radical shift here. He himself becomes our new temple. Look at chapter 2. Back to chapter 2. He picks up a whip. He cleanses the temple. They're going, what in the world? Who is this guy? And what gives him a right to... Chase out our money changers and turn over our tables. John 2, verse 18. What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things, the Jews said. John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews say, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of what? His body. And so, again, in chapter 4 here, he alludes to and further explains for us the same. As MacArthur states, this text in John 4, verses 20 through 24, is the most definitive, most important, and clearest teaching on the theme of worship in all the New Testament. She's asking about the fathers, the patriarchs, you can still go to the land of Israel today and find at the same place that she refers to, Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans did their perverted uh, 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 own version of uh, Passover and Pesach. You can still go today, uh, at your own risk, to uh, Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans gather. She has this place in mind. Uh, She knows the Jews worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says to her, verse 21, "Uh, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming. It won't be this mountain. It won't be Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. I fear that could be written over much of modern Christianity as well and so much of the confused and corrupted worship of the contemporary church. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know For salvation is from the Jews. And notice again verse 23. As we're answering the seventh question, how does the coming of Christ change worship? Notice, second time now. An hour, but an hour is coming. What is that hour? You know, don't you? If you're familiar with the New Testament, if you know John's gospel, four more times he will use this phrase throughout his gospel. Six times in total. The hour always points to and speaks of Calvary. Right? The cross. The crucifixion of our Lord. When that great veil in the temple would be torn and a new and living way would be opened up for us all. But you say, how? How could Jesus not only say the hour is coming, but uh, verse 23, even more shocking and more emphatic, and now is. The answer is because standing in front of them was the hour bringer. The supreme man of the hour. Seated right in front of this lonely, miserable, thirsty, lost, about to be saved, (laughs) immoral, adulterous, idol-worshipping, sex olator, this woman at the well. The hour is coming and now is. The true tabernacle, his name is Jesus. The true temple, his name is Jesus. (laughs) In a single conversation... Please, beloved, let this sink in for a moment. In a brief remark of a few verses, 
our Lord relocates the place God's people had worshipped for the past 1,500 years from a place to a person, Messiah Jesus, the very Son of God. Absolutely redefining worship in radical new covenant terms. Hour is coming, verse 23, and now is when the true worshipers will worship, keep reading, the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Question number eight. We've seen how the coming of Christ changes worship. Now, number eight, what is God like? What is God like? Who is the object of our worship? Who is the one who demands and deserves and requires and receives our worship? What is God like? Notice this radical shift, this total reorientation of worship is all premised upon the very nature of God himself. What he is like defines our worship. How you think about him is how you will approach him. False views of God's nature are always at the heart of false worship. One of the most important questions children could ask parents, and which parents should warmly, eagerly welcome and be ready to answer, Dad and Mom, is when they say to you, who made God? Dad, Mom, where was God in the beginning? Who created the Creator? In other words, what is God like? J.C. Ryle says, John 4, verse 24, these three words in English, God is spirit, is the most lofty, definite saying about the nature of God found in the whole Bible. Back to our catechism. Next question, what is God? Answer, God is a spirit. Language taken directly from this text. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. God the Father doesn't have a body, in other words. He's not made of any material or, or physical substance. He's not like all the other false gods, then and now, who are limited to some uh, sort of address or, or locale. You know, the golden calf god, or the, the, the sun god, or the, the moon god, or the, the fire god, or the sea god, or the, the river god, or the mountain god. No, this is the true and living god. He can't be painted, or drawn, or sculpted, or depicted in any way, except in the person of his son. Our Lord Jesus, God incarnate, God the Son, the God-man. And because God is spirit, he is infinite, he's omnipresent. When I'm speaking to young people, I like to put it this way. He is the everywhere, all the time, in every place God. <laughs> no one created him. Nothing can contain him. He has no beginning. He has no end. Because God is spirit, he's independent. He's life-giving. He's the fountain of all. He doesn't need you. You need him. <laughs> he has no body, so he never wears out. He neither sleeps nor slumbers, Scripture tells us. He's immortal. He's incorruptible. He's alive forever. He's invisible unless he reveals himself. He is unknowable unless he wants to make himself known. Three words, God is spirit, containing volumes and lifetimes of theological study and explanation and enormous implications. God is spirit. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. God does not dwell in temples made with hands, the scripture tells us. The highest heavens cannot contain him. The fanciest cathedrals, the grandest temples, the finest sanctuaries what did the Lord have to keep telling the Israelites in, 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 at Mount Sinai in Deuteronomy 4 and 5 and 6 and 7? Uh, you could not see a form, but you heard a voice. Isaiah chapter 40, to whom then will you liken God or, or what likeness will you compare with him? Remember that Jews couldn't even be allowed to use hands and tools when they were carving stones for their altars because the heart of man, as Calvin said, is such an incurable factory of idols that the minute we pick up a tool, we start to make an idol. Aren't you glad that doesn't apply to any modern technology? It's purely an ancient problem that has gone away. Isn't that comforting to know? We are incessant, incurable worshipers and perpetual idolaters apart from the grace and mercy of God and the instruction of Scripture. God is spirit. 
The second commandment, Exodus 20, the whole reason we're not to worship God with images or, 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 or shapes or symbols of any kind like all the other nations is because God is spirit. Nothing more basic could be said about the essence and substance of our God. But then you should be asking, okay, so then if God is, and if God is a spirit, then how does he want to be worshipped? It's the woman's burning question here beside Jacob's well on that hot Palestinian day. It should be our question here in the 21st century. How do you identify true worshipers if it's not by their location? And we'll talk tonight about the Lord has prescribed certain places and and gatherings, but in a radically new covenant fashion, distinctly different from the old. And if if you think uh, recognizing a true worshiper is, is mainly about how they dress and how formal or informal they are and how proper or how real and raw they are or, or how emotional and expressive they are, as I'm, I'm afraid many Christians believe today, or, or how uh, passionate or how much ramshala, 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 you know, fake tongues and fake prophecies and fake healings, uh, or maybe it's the bells and smells and it's the rituals and the symbols and it's the ceremonies. We need to get back to true worship, Jesus style, defined by Scripture. And the Lord's answer couldn't be clearer. He states it twice for emphasis. Verse 23, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Interesting how we keep falling back. Somehow in English we always find ourselves saying, oh yes, we must worship in spirit and in truth. That's not what it says. Did you hear the difference? It doesn't say in spirit and in truth. It's more emphatic than that. It's in spirit and truth. Two sides of the same coin. You don't get to say, oh, you know, for 2024, I got the truth thing down. I'm going to worship, work on more worshiping the spirit this year, you know. It's a package deal. And he repeats it a second time in case we missed it. Underlined, bold font, uh, punctuated and repeated. Verse 24, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. One preposition Two nouns. It's both or neither. And that brings us to the ninth and final question this morning. We've talked about why did God make the world? Why did God make you? What's wrong with worship? Is there anyone not worshiping? What's the definition of worship? What's the the worship story of Scripture? Come back tonight. Uh, How does Christ change worship? Number eight, what is God like? And number nine, what are the two criteria for true worship? What are the two criteria for for true worship. Beloved, what we're going to find here in verses 23 and 24 is a how and a who. How in spirit. Who do we worship and truth? What's the how of worship? Remember, she's been all worried about this mountain, that mountain, this address, that address, this location, that location, this magical, sacramental, experiential, tangible, uh, uh, feelable, sort of uh, uh, observable place. Jesus says, no, 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 a thousand times no. Worship is essentially spiritual, not physical, not geographical, not ceremonial, not ritual. As one preacher puts it, do you understand what happened at the death of Jesus when the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies was torn, ripped, shredded from top to bottom? Do you understand that was the symbol of the end of the entire Old Testament system of external and ceremonial and symbolic worship? He says, do you understand at that moment it was over and our Lord is already affirming this here and saying there will be no more temples, there will be no more places of worship where God is to be sought and found in that old covenant fashion. No more altars, no more priesthood of the Levites. No more of those sacrifices or vestments or incense or candles and all that goes with it. Whether it's the ill-informed, he says, worship of the Samaritans, the apostate worship of the Jews, it all disappears, it all passes away. An hour is coming and now is. But it was always about the heart, right? It's from Isaiah we get those words, you honor me with your lips, but... Your heart is far from me. It's from Amos we learn, stop your songs. Your hearts aren't right. I hate your feasts. I hate your Sabbaths. I hate what you're doing. It's from Malachi we learn, all you ever bring me is lame animals. Stop bringing me your leftovers. It's always been about the heart. But those symbols that once pointed in the direction of heart worship are now gone. 
in the radical nature of new covenant worship. In a sense, every place is a sanctuary. Every believer is a priest. Beware of any tragic substitute for the spiritual worship that our Lord calls for here. It's easy, friends. Let's face it. We can say we are unashamedly Protestant. I know many of you have been saved out of a Roman Catholic system, which is really just a Christianized Judaism, maybe a sort of Anglo Catholic high church Anglicanism, which is really just a form of Christianized Judaism as well, and old covenant kind of worship. But what I don't think we realize in the last hundred years, the Pentecostal charismatic movement often has totally redefined and reduced worship to a 20 minute praise and worship injection and experience. Jesus is saying to us, false worship is external from the outside in. True worship is internal from the inside out. It's worship from a newborn heart. Yes, it's small s, worship in spirit, because you're filled with capital S, the Holy Spirit. Him, the gift of the spirit of the living God, makes our spirits alive, empowers us for worship, makes you truly spiritual, so you can worship in spirit out of the fullness of the supernatural life we enjoy in Christ. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 34? Christ gives the Spirit without measure, without limit. My friend, this morning, have you worshipped? Have you honored God not only with your lips, but with a heart that is near, not far from Him? Is it merely outwardly? I know you're here physically. I see you and... Most of you, you know, varying levels of alertness at this point in the sermon. <laughs> but eager and, and uh, tangibly here, praise God. But that doesn't guarantee a sincere heart, even for the preacher. Is it true faith? Does the Lord see in me sincere affections? A broken and contrite spirit you will not despise, O Lord. These are your favorite offerings, Master. This is what I want to bring to you is... Real, heart, authentic, genuine worship in spirit. Lord, make me more like Mary, Luke 1, as we celebrate during Christmas. My soul, she said, boasts, exalts in the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Lord, make me more like Paul, Philippians 3. We are the true circumcision. We worship in the spirit of God. We boast. We glory in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. Lord, make me more like a Romans 12 Christian. In view of the mercies of God, I I offer up my life as a living sacrifice, as my holy and reasonable service of worship. But as somebody said, the only problem with living sacrifices is they squirm off the altar. (laughs) Lord, keep me there, not conforming to the world. Next verse in Romans 12, but being living a transformed life with a renewed mind. Listen to Spurgeon. He says, far more difficult to worship God in spirit than in form. You can patter and repeat a dozen Ave Marias, he says, or paternosters. So easy that you can nearly go to sleep while you're doing it. You can repeat a form of prayer in the morning and evening and pull out your nifty little prayer book, and it's, it means nothing. I'm a friend, but you can do that as well today. You can be the most charismatic, expressive, or somber, or big study Bible, or reformed theology. You can have all the trappings on the outside and be nowhere in your heart and in your life that you bring to worship gatherings. Spurgeon says, you can be thinking about shop and business all the while. You can go to church or chapel many times a week as merely a cheap duty while you are a thief or a hypocrite. But it's difficult, he says, very difficult to bring the heart low down to humble penitence. Thank you. Last Sunday, Dom, Joshua chapter 1, the discipline of biblical meditation Spurgeon goes on to say, to bring your soul to holy meditation. The last thing most people want to do is think. He says, the noblest part of our nature is often the least to be exercised. To tremble humbly before God. To confess sin before Him. To believe Him. To love Him. This is spiritual worship. The Father is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. And this anticipates all the richness of New Testament ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. We are living stones. We are the royal priesthood. We are his new temple. We are now his dwelling place. We're all Levites in Christ. All of life has a sacredness to it. Worship isn't just part of the Christian life. It is the Christian life. 
not limited to an hour on Sunday, but in, or a day, as important, as much as we love the Lord's Day, but it's an every day, 24-7 story and mark and characteristic of the Christian, a joy, a privilege to live a life of, a life of perpetual worship. Think about it individually as well as corporately. I love the way Bonar puts it individually. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise, that my whole being may proclaim thy being and thy ways. Not for the lip of praise alone, he says, not even the praising heart. No, I ask, Lord, for a life made up of praise in every part. Fill every part of me with praise. Let all my being speak of thee and of thy love, O Lord, poor though I be and weak. So shall no part of day or night from sacredness be free, but all my life in every step be fellowship with thee. Individually, but also corporately, as Cooper puts it so well. Jesus, where'er thy people meet, there they behold thy mercy seat. Where'er they seek thee, thou art found, and every place is hallowed ground. This is something of the how in spirit, but let's close with looking at the who. It's also worship that is in spirit and truth. Three times Jesus has named the one whom we worship. He is the Father, verse 21, verse 23. Twice the Father has been mentioned. God the Father. True worship is always Trinitarian. Many Christians are forgetting this today. The normal pattern with only rare exceptions in the New Testament. The overwhelming model of the New Testament is we come to worship to and we address God the Father in the name of Christ the Son empowered by God the Spirit. True worship conforms to the truth, to him who is the truth incarnate, him who was full of grace and truth. To worship in truth is worship that conforms to the word made flesh, God's new temple, God's new tabernacle, Jesus. There's one God and there is one mediator between God and men. And his name is the, the music leader and the worship leader. As long as the volume is right and the church spent enough on all the fancy uh, 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 performance. No, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. It, he, his name is the man Christ Jesus. All true worship is Christian worship. All non-Christian worship is false worship. Bob Coughlin puts it well. Jesus is where we meet God. Jesus is how we meet God. After he rose from the dead, the early Christians came to understand that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was the perfect, eternal fulfillment of everything the temple merely foreshadowed. He says the implications are staggering. There's nothing about our worship of God that is not defined and affected by Jesus Christ. And if Jesus goes on to say in John 17, Father, sanctify them, your people, by the truth. Your word is truth. No wonder then we speak about when we gather. The expository preaching of the word is not just one ministry. It's the fountain out of which every ministry flows. Because how will we know how to pray or praise or, or worship or serve or witness if we're not taught from God's word? No matter how sincere, emotional, and passionate you might be. True corporate worship is gathering to read the Bible. And we're not in a rush. And we'll read a whole psalm if need be. We know it doesn't fit all the you know, modern standards of how to hold people's attention. And then we're going to pray the Bible. We're not in a rush about that either. Then we're going to preach and teach the Bible. And if the sermon goes a whole hour, I'm blessed. And I pray that you are too. Because <laughs> we love the Word of God. And we're here to read the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, teach the Bible, and see the Bible in the two ordinances of communion and baptism, as we'll see tonight in the waters of baptism. God's truth defines and determines everything we do in worship. Can I put it to you as simply as I know how? Worship is not the music, and the worship leader is the preacher. I repeat, worship is not music, and the worship leader is the preacher. And most Christians today have never heard that, I'm afraid. Worship, according to Scripture, is loving God, adoring Him, obeying Him, praising Him in all of life. Music is simply one way, corporately when we gather, that we express our worship, as we'll see more tonight. 
Amen for the worship gathering of God's people on the Lord's Day as the climax and the culmination. Because birds of a feather flock together, last time I checked. And we love to gather with those who love what we love. And a joy shared is a joy multiplied. Why do people go to stadiums to watch games and concerts still in an age of, of TV and internet? And why are listeners still going to concert halls when everyone has Spotify and, and YouTube? Because we gather with those who love what we love. Martin Luther says at home, in my own house there's no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church when the multitude is gathered together, a fire kindles in my heart and breaks its way through. When did the first two missionaries and church planters get commissioned and sent out? When the church at Antioch gave their best. Acts 13, during corporate worship, the Lord called Paul and Barnabas. Have you ever noticed the priority people put on corporate worship tells a lot about the rest of their worship, a lot about their private worship daily habits, their family worship habits? If you live to worship on the other six days, you, you, you'll have a hard time finding anything better to do on a Sunday than getting to do it more and louder and corporately. <laughs> Corporate worship is for God, Scripture tells us, and it's for others. We sing to one another as we sing to the Lord. Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. We minister our offerings to the Lord and to one another. It's not just a collection of individuals seeking a personal experience. It's a community of worshipers giving him glory and edifying and building one another up. Beware of a consumer approach to worship. Puritans love to say, if forced to choose, prefer public worship over private. Public worship most closely resembles heaven and best fulfills the prayer Jesus taught us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For all eternity, we won't have any private quiet times. There won't be any private devotions. <laughs> we'll be stuck with one another forever and ever, perfectly, lovingly, purely, publicly, openly, corporately, singing, worthy is the Lamb. The more we rehearse now, the better. The Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. It means you need a spirit that's alive and you need a mind that's in love with truth. One writer applies as well. He says, spirit and truth. It means real worship comes from the spirit within and it's based on true views of God. In other words, worship must have heart and head. Engage the emotions and the thoughts. Truth without emotion, he says, is dead orthodoxy in a church full of unspiritual fighters and argument winners. Emotion without truth is empty, frenzy, and flaky people afraid of rigorous thought. True worship, he says, comes from people deeply emotional, lovers of deep and sound doctrine. We worship in spirit and truth. My prayer is that someone here today only realizes they've never really known Christ. And you've been in a lot of worship services and you've done a lot of worship activities, but only today would you repent and give your life to Christ. And today was your first actual worship service. Welcome. Congratulations. Praise God. Good to have you in the family of real worshipers. And what greater motive could we ask for in closing, beloved? The Father himself. We didn't think this up. We didn't save ourselves. He loved us first. He elects. He draws. He chooses. He seeks. This is unparalleled language. Like nowhere else in the Bible. The Father is seeking actively, personally, the hound of heaven pursuing idolaters and turning them into worshipers, adulterers like this woman and turning them into adorers of the Almighty. How about this kind of seeker-sensitive worship service? How about a church that is so sensitive about the most important seeker of all, the true and living God, and wanting his approval and worshiping in his way? My prayer for us the church body, as we head into 2024, is what the Lord did at Philippi. Remember in Acts 16, as the Father was seeking worshipers, he took a wealthy homeowner like Lydia, you could say a you know, suburbanite, and swung open the door of her heart and saved her. And then he went to a demon-possessed slave girl in the marketplace and saved her too through the same 
preaching of the gospel. And then a government worker, a Roman jailer, about to kill himself, bowed the knee, and he became a worshiper as well. May the Lord continue to seek and add to our choir as we prepare for eternal worship. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful. We're thankful for the clarity of your word. Forgive us for sometimes, too often, we confess the distraction of our hearts, the complacency of our worship, even as we'll learn further tonight. uh, uh, Who are those permitted into your presence? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can come into his holy place? We pray, Lord, teach us, mature us, grow us individually in our private worship, in our family worship, and so that corporately, in the culmination of it, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, every Sunday would only further fuel our offerings of praise and our lives of sacrifice and our pleasing worship and the fragrant aroma of our adoration before you, our worthy God and King and your Son's Saving name we pray. Amen.